Hey, Tone, how are you? Good. How are you guys? Uh, all good, all good. Just enjoying the long weekend and obviously the good weather yesterday in London. It was pretty brilliant, nice sunny weather. And then back to the grey of London today. So, uh, uh, guys, well, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in Panama. The weather here has been really good. Usually it's hot, humid and miserable every day of like, you know, of the year. But today it's actually nice. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, Zach, where are you today? Uh, you're driving. That's what I know. Driving uh, back to New York City, where I'm based. Okay, nice. I hope the weather there is good. It's not going to be that great, to be honest. Maybe getting better now, right? It's actually beautiful right now. Oh, it's lovely. Lovely. Good to hear. So, yeah, guys, welcome to the Financial Summit Spaces. Uh, this is the second of our bi-weekly space, the SADAS. Well, it's normally on a Saturday, but today it's Sunday. So the Sunday one, uh, this is this space today is mostly going to be revolving around SEC Coinbase. Obviously, price action. We are seeing some nice bullish action today. So I will take Tone's view on what is going on with the markets. Um, I'm going to do the space in a bit of a different manner today. So uh, Tone, uh, the first section of our space, I want to call it market's health so how is the market's health tone what do you see and what do you expect from the market you said held right is that the word um i, I picked up sorry the word was held right no the market's wealth market's wealth uh sorry market's health <laughs> my bad the health of the market the health oh, of the crypto health. and okay gotcha um no i think the market is insanely healthy right now uh i really wanted us to reach seventy-eight thousand before the halving i kind of want to see it happen uh this upcoming week or next week so we do have two weeks for that to happen uh we're back at seventy-one thousand. i think bitcoin price reflects the health of the market when uh the price isn't crashing and when it isn't uh, you know rising unreasonably quickly and we've been in this seventy thousand dollar zone for two weeks now maybe even more and uh i think that's incredibly healthy anytime there is stability in the price of bitcoin the market is healthy by default only when uh prices you know are going up quick or going down quick can you say that something is wrong with the health of the market so i think this is great uh, obviously uh, as this consolidation slowly trends higher, it makes me more and more bullish. Hundred percent. It's looking. It's looking like tone. Like sixty nine is the new, you know, forties areas. The for, uh, the forty area that we had before. You know, nice consolidation. The level is being bought up every time. So sixty sixty to the sixty range is looking pretty pretty. You know, solid in terms of buying power. And with the last space, we were discussing this. And uh, I think uh, someone mentioned uh, this that at this point of time, with all the selling, I think it was Kapoor when he came onto the space and he said, with all this selling pressure that we right now have, with the bad news coming in for the SEC versus Coinbase, we have like FT, uh, SBF being uh, you know punished for whatever he has done, 25 years in jail. All these things are happening. All the selling is happening and the market doesn't want to budge. It's like, yeah, I don't care. It doesn't matter. There's still buying going on. So that's looking pretty nice uh, from all the, well, all the I will, signs. I will say that SBF getting 25 years is a very is a net positive for the market. Now, if SBF got, say, three years, which I kind of thought it would be closer to three than 25, but if SBF got off light, uh, you know, people would have been a little more upset people uh, would have been a little uh I, I think the price of bitcoin could have hindered hindered a little bit because you would assume that there is some kind of an agenda going on and uh uh or sbf has you know some kind of information on government entities and regulators uh, that gave him this light sentence or he got some kind of a deal uh so the heavy sentence on sbf is actually positive for the market in my opinion but I'd like to hear Zach's takes on it. Uh, Zach's a lawyer. Um, I honestly think that 25 years is a little too much for his crime. Uh, I mean, uh, 
he wasn't alone in this. Uh, regulators should have known. Uh, his partner should have known. Like someone else, like there's way more important people than SBF that were responsible for FTX's, uh, re, you know, scamming. And uh, SBF got the brunt of it, just like what happened with Bernie Madoff. Uh, he wasn't alone in this. Um, I would have rather have SBF do five years, but other names, names that are actually important uh, in the global, in the U.S. financial system, you know, get some, uh, maybe not time, but at least, uh, you know, at least something like get fired or like shown how they were complicit or irresponsible in assisting SBF. So personally, I'm very disappointed with how that situation ended. Uh, but I'd like to hear Zach's take. How's that? Yeah, look, I, I think I think 25 years is in, in the realm of reasonable. I, I agree that's a pretty stiff sentence. But I, I think SBF had many opportunities to have a different outcome here, not just in terms of his conduct that led him here. Right. There were lots of off ramps, even when things were going bad at Alameda. He didn't need to siphon off customer funds from FTX to gamble away to try and reverse his fortune. After everything collapsed, uh, he could have worked with law enforcement instead of going on this weird publicity tour. Uh, you know, he could have pled guilty, you know, when he knew that everyone was turning against him. And, and even, you know, this week at his sentencing hearing, he could have shown a lot more contrition and shown remorse instead of dwelling on the facts and, you know, having his lawyer uh, paint him like, you know, a, a hero of some sort. He called him a beautiful puzzle and a Talmudic scholar and all these things that were just like not tethered to reality. And so 25 years, I agree, is like a quite a stiff sentence for a white collar crime. But, you know, Sam bankman did everything in his power to make sure that he would have a really stiff sentence by fucking up at every possible juncture. But is it, I mean, looking at it from a crime perspective, it's a financial crime. It's uh, obviously he has uh, gambled away people's money, which is not correct. But there were some statements made during that, that he would make the uh, all the customers whole. He will give back everything that he could. Uh, in for you know for whatever he has done wrong, he'll try to he will give back everything. Do you guys think that at any point that was the truth? Like there was any truth in that those statements? No, well, it's not it's not up to him at this point, right? He was the head of the company that is now bankrupt, and John Ray, who is the interim CEO of the company, the same person who liquidated the Enron assets, was in charge of clawing back money to give back to to FTX's depositors and creditors. Um, I think John Ray did a pretty good job. They got really lucky that FTX happened to make a venture investment in Anthropic, which is an AI company that ended up doing incredibly well. And that was a key part of getting uh, investors back their money. If you look at the way the judge dealt with that sentencing, I, I think Judge Kaplan correctly said, like, look, you know, if you steal money and you take that money to a casino in Vegas and you double it and you give the money back to the person that you stole the money from, that doesn't make it not theft. And I think the same thing is here with the anthropic investment. And it's not Sam's money, right? He, he stole money. Uh, depositors were kind of made whole, right? They were made whole on the value of their assets as of the time of the uh, bankruptcy at FTX, where I think Bitcoin was at $16,000 and Solana was at $12. So that's pretty cold comfort when you look at Bitcoin at 71000 and Solana at all-time highs. Um, so, no, I don't buy that you know, depositors are really made whole, certainly not in crypto terms. And to the extent that they are made whole, I don't buy that that is good action on SBF's part that he should get credit for. I think, you know, they got lucky on some of their investments and the liquidator did a good job. That's not Sam's doing personally. Okay. Uh, Tone, anything from your side? No, no, that's it. Cool. Uh, let's let's move on to the elephant in the room, uh, Coinbase versus SEC. So, Zach, I want to read out a statement that was made by Coinbase in June 2023. Uh, so the statement stated that the SEC can pursue its claim only if the tokens and staking services it has identified are securities. And then after that, there was a smirk and it was the person that was being interviewed uh, said they are not. Uh, first of all, we have heard some new, like obviously, 
new things have come out on this case uh, for Coinbase versus SEC. Uh, do you think this statement uh, will will be held like, you know, when the case is going on right now, it was about not even getting it to the court, but it's in the court now. Do you think the, these are valid statements? And on top of that, do you think this will have any impact on the judgment that is going to come later on? No, not really. I mean, so one of the things I think is very confusing about this type of case is the difference between a security and a securities offering, right? So when we talk about what a security is, a security is some type of financial instrument that people tend to invest in. And most securities are, they're securities on purpose. So like the the three most famous types of securities, there are sort of equities, right? Uh, Which are securities that represent ownership in some sort of business enterprise. Uh, which are securities on purpose. If I buy a share of your company, we all know that's security, and I get some percentage of dividends from the company, I get some percentage of the company sold, I get rights to vote on what happens to the company, I'm an owner, right? Then the second big type of securities are also securities on purpose. Those are debt securities, that's fixed income, right? We enter into some sort of agreement where you, I give you money now and you agree to pay some fixed amount of money back to me over time, some principal press interest. And debt securities are meant to be securities. There's no question about whether they are. And then the third is like explicit contractual securities. So a stock option, you know, some kind of derivative, uh, which is just, you know, it's not normal debt or equity, but it's some type of financial instrument that we paper up and it's a contract and security on purpose. None of those are what we're talking about in crypto. In crypto, we're generally talking about this fourth catch-all category of securities offerings called investment contracts. And investment contracts are different because unlike the first three categories we talked about, the assets we're talking about with investment contracts are not securities on purpose, and they're not literally securities at all, right? Investment contracts can apply to commodities, collectibles, actual securities. They can apply to lots of things. And what an investment contract analysis is, is under the Howey test, it looks at the way an asset, whether or not it's security, is it sold in a way that is legally deemed to be as securities offering and confer SEC jurisdiction? So... I think if you're asking, like, you know, are these things that we're talking about, are these tokens, are the staking program, are they literally securities? I think the answer to that is pretty clearly no, but that's not the legal question. The legal question is when someone is buying these tokens on Coinbase's platform, whether they're buying it directly from the person who created the token or whether they're buying it from another person who's holding the token on the secondary market, are the expectations they have when they're buying that token in conjunction with sort of the full set of facts about the marketing materials from the token issuer, you know, what we know about the token's ecosystem, you know, the the reasons that someone might buy or sell something, does that altogether create a legal situation where, you know, you have, legally speaking, an investment contract and therefore a securities offering? And um, the judge in the most recent ruling, I'm sure we'll get into greater detail, said, in theory, like, yes, that could be the case, right? It does not just because you have assets that are not set up as securities and just because they're being sold on the secondary market does not mean that they're not being sold in securities offerings. It does not mean the SEC lacks jurisdiction, which is the biggest ruling from this uh, summary judgment motion. Um, Yeah, most of the things went over my head uh, because I am trying to understand all these things apart from trading and suddenly all these things come into the picture and I'm like, ah, never studied these things. But uh, we have Joe here who has a lot of understanding uh, about everything that is related to law. We have Zach here, who is a lawyer himself and has a lot of understanding of the same. And then we have Tone, who is a veteran in this industry and knows everything about what we want to know. So let's start off with Tone right now. Tone, Zach tried to summarize a lot of things together in regards of securities, uh, tokens being securities and not being securities and how different securities work. What do you think uh, from that statement, from being a veteran of the market, how do you see it? Yeah, so um, as I stated last time, and I know Joe wasn't here, but Zach commented on it. I disagree. I, I usual, I'm usually on the side of the SEC. I'm the guy that screams everything in crypto is a security, and uh, the SEC needs to do its damn job, which they can't do because they're unreasonably, grossly incompetent. And they have been uh, for the last several years. Now, having said that, this SEC case was one of those cases that I felt SEC is grossly overreaching 
on what the job they should be doing. Now, this is my non-professional opinion. SEC should have gone after Ethereum for being a security 10 years ago. Uh, they should have gone after Ripple way earlier. They should have stopped a lot of these scams. Something like Hex should have never been able to get off the ground. And the SEC completely dropped the ball. When they tried going after Ripple, it was too late. They were incompetent in the Ripple case. Uh, to me, they almost lost that whole thing. And I don't see anything uh, good happening from a decision that has been made, though it looks like some judges are throwing out the original ruling and it may be appealed, but we'll see. In this particular case- Hey, hey, yeah. hey Tone, Tone yeah. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I just had a question for clarification. When you say too late, what do you mean? That you, because, I mean, it wasn't barred by a statute against XRP. What do you, what do you mean with respect to Lip, Ripple? Uh, what I mean too late with respect to Ripple is they allowed Ripple to get way too powerful, have billions of dollars for their defense, hire former SEC heads uh, to manage their legal team. Uh, they went after them way too late when Ripple already had relationships with, you know, like World Economic Forum, and they're going to be the new banking currency. Uh, I, I mean, too late in that sense. Uh, Ten four. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, uh, now on the SEC thing, and uh, here's where Joe and Zach will, uh, you know, set me straight. Is they're trying to accuse the SEC of, you know, doing a bunch of stuff with securities, uh, naming specific tokens without having these tokens be classified as securities first uh not to mention not even going after these individual tokens themselves they're trying to go after coinbase instead and uh i think this particular you know uh move by the sec i feel is a is an overreach now maybe if let's say five or ten of security of tokens sec already deals with out of their hundred have already been identified as securities. Uh, and remember, Ripple uh, Ripple was removed from Coinbase, but it looks like Ripple can come back to Coinbase because it's not a security on the secondary market, according to the judge, right? So if the SEC had some kind of you know standing here saying, well, we already went after 10 tokens and we were able to prove they're all securities, you had all of these 10 tokens, you have 100 more, so, that gives them a little bit of standing, in my view, of uh, going after them. Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. So, Tone, Tone before we, we move on to more topics, maybe let's talk about this for a little bit. So, I think on each of these things, so first on the Ripple case, like, it is definitely an embarrassing loss for the SEC. We talked about this a little bit last time. I think that was just a really bad ruling by the judge. I think that was sort of an anomaly. I think that ruling is to be overturned on appeal. And the Ripple case, as it is right now, is not going to stand. I think that the SEC is going to pull that one out in the end. But what, what you're saying about the not involving the token issuers in this case, that's technically true, right? The SEC could have brought individual cases against Solana and Algorand and Polygon and all these tokens they're naming in this case and some of the like bottom of the barrel shit coins they're going after. But in order to win their case against Coinbase on the secondary trading of these tokens, they actually do have to win in court on these tokens are being sold as securities offerings, right? So they, 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 are, they are now trying to make the argument in court. They do have to successfully argue that the Howey test applies to these tokens. They're just not doing it in a case where the token issuers themselves are a party. They're kind of doing it in bulk against Coinbase. Now, right, but that that, exactly. It's a lot easier for them to win. Right, right, but that's also not fair, right? Like, uh, look, I hate shit coins as much as the next guy, but they deserve the opportunity to defend themselves. So I think that's also a shit move by the SEC if they can pull it off. Uh, go on, Joe. Uh, Joe or Zach, you guys are muted. Yeah, so. Okay, so let's let's talk about this strategically. So I, I want to give you some insight into why I think they're taking the strategy that they did uh, really in early Q1 of 2023 to go after this in an omnibus way against Coinbase, against Binance, against uh, Kraken. Um, they, they filed these suits in an omnibus way, citing these numerous tokens because logistically, okay, from just a human resources standpoint, just a practical standpoint tone, for them to do what you're saying, I think, would have been untenable. It would have far exceeded their reach uh, in terms of just logistics, okay? 
and meaning that you to file, you know, 10 plus different suits against folks, many of which you've got jurisdictional issues, you've got issues uh, relating um, to, you know, who, who you're actually hauling into court uh, to actually sue. Um, you've got all sorts of idiosyncratic issues with respect to the tokens when their strategy was, let's just go for the quote unquote choke point. Let's go for the exchange. Let's try to hamper the exchange's activity generally, and we'll t flow in all these different suits together into one where we can sort of, you know, rather than, you know, cut off the head of a serpent and have three more appear, let's just go through the whole thing. Let's kill the whole thing in terms of a full frontal attack on the biggest crypto exchanges in the United States. And I think that was the concerted effort that they set forth in their suit. They filed this very almost unwieldy piece of litigation where it's got, you know, it's, it's not only just a case within a case, it's got like 12 cases within the case and different theories. And basically the most comprehensive suit you could have fled against the exchanges, attacking their staking activity, exactly uh, attacking wallet behavior, attacking numerous tokens on there, saying they don't have proper registrations to be a broker dealer or a clearinghouse, or in, they're engaging in an unregistered securities exchange. They have a very broad suit. And I think that is not just an accident. It was saying like we have to, we have limited manpower, and we recognize we're dealing with a very powerful interest at this point that has had the benefit of multiple you know multiple cycles to build up their reserves to defend themselves in court uh, with some very fine lawyers representing them. So we really need to have sort of a statement piece of litigation, and I think that's what they had. They, they, that's what they did, right? So like the alternative where you go after them one at a time piecemeal, I think that would have made matters if, from the SEC standpoint far more difficult to prove. And it would have made, it would have just, I mean, imagine that you've got, you would have litigation all over the place, multiple suits. And it's just, I don't think it's practical from a manpower standpoint. And it's a real consideration you have to factor in. Gotcha. Also in terms of the, the remedies here. So certainly I think there is a sense in which if you're one of these token issuers, you, you think it's unfair a, that the SEC is like naming all of these tokens specifically without actually, you know, uh, litigating against you and giving you enough your day in court. Um, and then second is like there is a way in which this makes the SEC case a lot easier because they really just have to win on at least one of these tokens to show that Coinbase is operating as a unregistered securities exchange. On the other hand, um, certainly these token issuers have an interest in the case. A lot of them will be filing briefs to help Coinbase. So they will try and have some say. And then the other reason why this might be less unfair than it seems on the surface is when you think about the remedy, at least in this case, the financial penalties here will be against Coinbase, right? There's no automatic penalties against any of these token issuers if the court in this case finds their securities offering. Of course, you know, if Coin, if the SEC wins this case, they are likely to bring cases against the individual tokens afterwards. Um, but that's, you know, they have to do that extra step. It's not like if the SEC wins this particular case and a judge finds that, you know, Algorand was being sold as a securities offering on Coinbase, that automatically the SEC then go, gets to go and, and find Algorand Foundation a ton of money. Well, or they may never, right? They may never pursue that additional right. remedy. They could, they could, because they have, they would have. Uh, they you know, they some, probably will at some point, but yeah. yeah but 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 the, but the point to Zach's point is like spot on, right? Like like the 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 remedy here is against one entity, at least in the Coinbase suit. It's against Coinbase. That's it. So like the notion that, uh, you know, the notion that like there's going to be some uh, definite remedy from this, uh, and there's no one to defend themselves. They're going to be in the case. They're going to be involved. There's going to be a ton of amicus briefs. And, and to me, like I think. You know, the judge, Jack, Zach, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I thought I remember this judge specifically commented, like, you just need to prove one of these things uh, are security, and that undermines uh, their ability to operate. They're operating an unregistered exchange at that point. I think she, uh, I think I remember she specifically commented on that. Yeah, I also, dis I also disagree with, you know, that statement. Like, just because, like, they have like a hundred of these things, and the SEC never gave clear guidance. And uh, they can't. They, I mean, right. okay. So and let's I, talk and, about that for a second. And, and identifying you... one of them as a problem, suddenly the whole business is done. Again, I hate Coinbase and I hate shit coins. But to me, this is one, uh, one of those times where the SEC is overreaching. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. There is not a mechanism currently available to the SEC for them to publish a list of tokens in uh, in and of themselves as being securities. And that goes to what Zach's comments 
which were very thorough and informative. I thought earlier he did a great breakdown of this, this idea of the catch all of an investment contract. Okay. This theory. Okay. What we know now from multiple pieces of litigation is that the thing in and of itself really is not a security. Even the judge, she remarked on this in itself. She said she, she actually, you know, disagreed with some of the early precedent and said that like, you know, she's not going to believe in this categorical um, secondary market transactions cannot be uh, investment contracts. She, she re rejects that in the motion to dismiss or excuse me, motion for uh, judgment on the pleadings. But the key thing, like the takeaway is that like it's a very fact specific uh, exercise and it's also a transaction specific exercise. You're looking at the actual activity itself and whether that runs afoul of the law. So why is that important? Because in in the crypto world, right, if I spin up a token and I just create a token, Joe coin, OK, it's very dubious that that Joe coin, without it being sold or promoted or at any in any way, you know, sort of given uh, get, uh, dispatched into the market, that that is an investment contract. I think that was that no one that I've ever encountered, no serious uh, academic or legal scholar on the issue has said that just spinning up an ERC-20 in its in and of itself would in fact be an investment contract. The investment contract analysis really comes in on a transactional basis, right? So it's like the question of like what specific transactions would, would trigger a securities analysis, which is why the SEC can't, SEC can't do what you're saying, Tone. They can't just issue some sort of like directive that all these tokens in and of themselves are securities. It's really more about the issuance. It's more about the secondary market sales. Those types of things are, the, are what would give you indicia of whether they are, in fact, a investment contract. So, Joe, Joe, what I think you're saying is is technically right. Uh, I think that lets the SEC off a little bit easy, though, right? Like, as a practitioner, right, if I'm advising someone who's creating a token, there are some legitimate gray areas just in the law, not in terms of the SEC's policy, but like how a court would treat tokens. I think the two biggest ones are, I mean, I guess there are three big ones. One is uh, the sort of quote, quote, unquote, utility token argument, right? If something is being offered as a consumer product or, or positioned as a consumer product rather than as an investment vehicle, at what point does that make it, you know, not a security because the expectation of someone who's purchasing it is to use it to consume it rather than to invest in it. Another but isn't that just guidance? Know. Isn't that just guidance? Exactly. Like what you're talking about is not like giving a stamp of approval for the instrument. Yeah. It's giving a stamp of guidance. guidance but, for but SEC guidance and no action letters would go a huge way in terms of creating clarity in the industry and at least just them having a policy of, listen, we know there are gray areas. Here are areas we're going to pursue and here are areas we're not going to pursue, which is pretty – like even in like marijuana, which is not a gray area under federal law, you have the Cole memo, which says we're not going after dispensaries that are following state law. The SEC could 100 percent do something like that to protect investors in the industry. I think their current sort of – I think the, the claims of regulation by enforcement – and instead of trying to give guidance and clarity and no action letters, they're just doing lawsuits. I think that is a fair critique of the SEC, For notwithstanding sure. the technical questions. I don't disagree with that at all. I completely endorse it. And I think they should give more guidance and no action letters. That would be very easy for people to you know, <laughs> develop things around. But as you, you know, as well as I, once you get some of that out there, uh, people are very savvy, right? They would they will do things to protect themselves from liability. Uh, I don't think that's that's a stretch. I mean, I think people will clearly try to not run afoul of the law and still launch these things, which to me, I think is what they're worried about, right? They're worried about. Yeah, I I, I think that's a really important point to like stick on for a second, and I, and, I, and for those in the audience who are sort of new to this point, I think aside from like the legal questions we're talking about, there's this sort of real politic question like what are the sec's incentives here and i think one of the big incentives of the sec is they're in a little bit of a turf war specifically with the cftc which regulates commodities whereas the sec regulates securities over who's going to be the prime regulator for crypto and everyone in crypto wants to be a commodity rather than a security because it allows you to use blockchain infrastructure that you in a way you couldn't use if you're a security and so the sec is worried if they give some clear guidance which they kind of should do if they want to support the industry that like creative lawyers and creative developers are just going to innovate right around whatever they say and find a loophole. And then there's going to be like SEC compliance coins and SEC compliance. I see. And it's just, you know, that they're going to like drive a truck through the loophole the SEC creates. They, they, so, so in other words, put differently, okay, they prefer the ambiguity that exists in the marketplace because it allows them to 
basically ex exercise discretion and go after the bigger entities. And just to return to a point earlier that you made, Tone, the reason I interrupted you rudely about the issue of like, do you think it was too late is because, you know, there's plenty of things that launch. And I, and I know this is a factor for the SEC. They look at like what actually builds traction, what actually becomes a multi-billion dollar market cap, because they have limited resources and they're not going to go after Joe coin. If it has a market cap of precisely $1, they're going to go after the multi-billion dollar shit coins because that's where the money's at. That's where they believe that, you know, the people have really benefited from running afoul of the securities laws. And that's their discretion. Like they're going to go after big players as opposed to, you know, the t every one of the 10,000 shit coins that have launched that are just worthless. So talking hey, about the big players, sorry, go on, Tone. Well, like, yeah, I, I do want to move on to economics while Joe was here and eventually uh you know we'll move on to uh bitcoin price and economics but joe before you came on uh zach and i discussed uh like the sam bagman freed 25 year sentence and i would love to get your comment what i stated earlier is i personally think that sentence is a bit high uh i thought he would get less and i i would rather have him get less i would have been happy with him getting 10 to 15 and but at the same time what i'm not happy about is that no one else got punished for this and not in any way i mean regulators dropped the ball other people were involved the banks would have been involved there were lots of people that knew what the hell was going on and they were happy to uh let people get scammed and just like with bernie madoff no one else got in trouble uh same thing here so that's the part that bothers me the most and uh, whether Sam Bankman fried got 10 or 25 doesn't make that much of a difference. I thought it was a little bit too big of a sentence. Same thing for Ross Ubrick, of course. Well, definitely agree on Ross. Um, no, no problem there. I, I, I'll, I'll start by saying that. Um, as Zach knows, because we talked about it in real time, you know, I was a huge believer of the fact that he would eventually plead for this. I, 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 to be honest, I was shocked that he actually went to trial on it. Um, and I, and I believe that that firmly weighed on some of the sentencing considerations, the fact that he, you know, didn't just plea out and show remorse and do what he needed to do to cooperate further. Um, his, 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 uh, unwillingness to accept reality, I think did cost him some years of his life, uh, that he'll, uh, unfortunately will end up regretting. Um, but no, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I, I think for the, for the, for what he put the prosecutors through when they had him dead to rights, um, I think that, uh, 25 years is perhaps an, uh, perhaps too low. Um, I really think that he probably should have been higher. Yeah, I don't feel bad for prosecutors, sorry, especially government. I, I don't feel bad for government prosecutors, ever. <laughs> sorry, Joe. Uh, no, 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 it's not, it's not feeling bad for government prosecutors. It's like they had him dead to rights. There never should have been a trial on this issue. I mean, I guarantee you that, I mean, I shouldn't say guarantee. I, I, I believe that if his lawyers weren't telling him to plea this out and accept responsibility, um, then they were probably, uh, you know, sorely. I, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not going to say anything negative about them, but I just think that was a huge mistake. Like he should have pled this out. I think what, what was reported, at least in court, was that he was never offered anything. So be it. He was never offered anything. Um, you know what? D deal with that as it comes. But when, when they have you dead to rights and you're not going to plea and accept responsibility, um, you can't really complain at that point when you get a sentence like this. Yeah, no, okay. this, is, this could be another debate between Joe and I. Uh, I just... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Zach. Just go ahead, Zach. No, you want to oh, lose that? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I was saying that the, the, the problem with white collar criminal defendants in a lot of cases, especially people who've never been in trouble, I think is they tend to just not appreciate how much trouble they're in, right? I think the way in many cases, and, and I think maybe part of what happened in this case is you start by doing something small, right? And then things move against you. And then you have to take more and more steps to like cover your ass. And then all of a sudden you've done stuff that is a way bigger crime than you could have ever imagined committing. And then you get caught and you have to make peace with, you know, your life is very different, right? Sam Bagman fried was the darling of Washington, D.C. He was, you know, helping to create crypto legislation. He had Bill Clinton coming to the Bahamas for his conference. Everyone thought he was, you know, the face of the effective altruist movement. 
And going from that, right, to you're a criminal, to, you know, it, let's say he did get a, a plea deal. Let's say it was a very generous plea deal that was 15 years. Getting yourself to say, like, yes, to, to I'm going to agree to spend 15 years in prison. I just think psychologically that tends to be very hard, even if it's the right decision. And, um, you know, Tone, I said to you before, I think that, like, part of the reason we saw 25, I agree with Joe, this is Sam Bankman fried doing everything in his power to, to make the situation worse for himself. And it did not need to end this way, even given what he was charged with. Um, but, like, I think it's just hard to wrap your mind around what your situation is. Sure, you, you you absolutely do, and that is the job of the lawyer. Okay, that uh, I mean, we may disagree on this act, but like, I believe that is firmly the job of his lawyer. Get whoever you need to get in the room. Get the parents in the room. Get whoever you need to do to have a, a tough conversation to say you need to see the light. You fucked up royally, excuse my language, uh, and you need to make sense of this in your head. You need to just deal with it yeah, and accept responsibility. Right. So, so I'll, uh, again, like I said, this could be a debate between me and you guys later on. So we're not going to talk about it too much more. But I think this is one of the problems with the system. The fact that the government can offer you 10 years not to go to court. And then if you go to court, it becomes They didn't offer him five. anything. Hey, hold on, hold on, full stop. The, t- tone, they did not offer him anything. The public reports, if they're to be trusted, were that he had no deal offered, period. No, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not picking on him specifically, necessarily, right? Like in general, in general, it's like the government feels disrespected when someone doesn't take their offer. And if they go to court, they now get like double the sentence. This is a general thing in. in Yeah, yeah. Tone, I actually I actually agree with this point in general. Like, uh, I think, you know, getting credit for being genuinely remorseful is one thing. I do think, especially in the federal system. And look, this is because the government needs to conserve resources and they can't have everyone go to trial. But like the practice of I'm not saying in this case in particular, but certainly in some cases, stacking charges to be like, listen, you know, we caught you with, you know, a little bit of heroin, but you were doing it on behalf of the gang. So if you go to trial, we're going to charge you with conspiracy and you might do the rest of your life in prison or you plead out now and get 10 years. Like, I, I do agree with you right. that that heavy handed practice. Um, is yeah, yeah, but let's 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 leave drugs out of this. OK, let's leave narcotics out of this entirely. Let's I just talk about this. That. This is a fun. Yeah, this is a financial crime. OK, <laughs> where they had records. I mean, listen, you get discovery. You know what the prosecutors have, okay? And any sensible defense attorney, white-collar defense attorney, would say, I'm sorry, Mr. Banking Freed, you don't have a defense here. The, you know, uh, the aloof billionaire uh, is just not going to work as a defense. You need to accept reality. And in this, I I agree on the drugs. thing, And that's a totally different, uh, to me, I don't think that's a good comparison. Well, but, but Joe, both, both can be both can be true, right? I, I think it is both as a tactical matter. It is almost certainly like malpractice as an attorney in this case to be like, not say you need to plead guilty and do exactly what you're saying, right? As a as Sam's defense lawyer, I think that is the only thing you can do. And I assume that the first couple lawyers he talked to all said that, and then maybe he rejected it and, and hired other lawyers. Uh, but that's a tactical question. I think that's different than the sort of broader moral question is, is it good that people get as much credit for pleading guilty as opposed to going to trial that they do? Yeah. And, uh, real, yeah. So real, real quick, Zach, on something that you said about the government not having enough resources, uh, it's the constitutional right of everyone in America to get a trial by their peers of jury. And if the government can't handle taking every single action they bring against a person to trial, then the government has too many laws or they're wasting too much money. Uh, no, that's not that's not the issue. They, they, they can handle every single case that every single case they bring forward. That's not the issue. The issue is, should a credit be issued for cases where the defendant accepts and just pleads out versus, you know, takes the matter to trial and goes the distance? I think it, it sounds like from a common man's point of view, it sounds like if you already know that you have made the mistake and we already have the evidence that you have made the mistake, why do you want to waste everyone's time? Exactly. That's perfectly put. That is the whole premise behind why this credit is issued in certain cases. Makes sense. So guys, uh, I mean, a lot of discussions. Uh, Any other thing on this specific bit that you guys have discussed? Uh, Tone, any questions from you or anyone? Just go off mute, push push your question, and then 
Uh, we can carry no, on. No, no, no. I'm good. I'd love to dive into some of the economics. But there's a lot more coming through. Uh, if today's space is going to be tone me listening, you asking them a lot of questions when you're when you want to challenge them on something, and then Joe and Zach explaining to us what is really happening in this bloody world of SEC. So moving on a bit away from Coinbase, uh, we talked about Ripple, and uh, on March 25th there was a statement that came out that SEC. Uh, seeks two billion dollars in uh, from Ripple Labs. Uh, this was the statement that came out. So, firstly, Joe or Zach, can you either of you explain that they have lost the case? How can they be, uh, you know, seeking money now? So they they didn't lose the case, right? So the SEC brought a bunch of claims against Ripple Labs, which is the company that issued the XRP cryptocurrency token, saying they violated the securities laws in a bunch of different ways. And uh, the case, you know, survived this motion to dismiss stage that we just talked about with Coinbase. They went through discovery and then they had the summary judgment stage, which is where a judge rules after discovery who wins the case. And there was a split decision. The SEC won on some points and Ripple Labs won on some points. And we talked before about the ruling that seems to apply to secondary markets, which is like the really important part that Ripple Labs won. I express my view. I think that, that was a crappy ruling by the judge that's going to get turned over on appeal. But uh, the SEC did win on primary sales, basically what we call private sales or pre-sales or pre-mines that Ripple Labs sold to uh, private investors. And in that instance, the court found that the SEC was right that those were securities offerings, those sales of XRP, and that Ripple Labs did not follow the securities laws with regard to those sales. Now, the and that's what they're seeking the tune of $2 billion for. The ironic part is like private sales to investors are, are very easy to follow the securities laws. Uh, and like nowadays, the way people sell tokens in the private market or through token warrants or SAFTs or types of agreements that are meant to comply with this U.S. securities laws. And so like as a matter of legal precedent for the crypto industry, that part of the ruling actually doesn't matter very much. But uh, the, you know, Ripple Labs sold tons and tons of XRP to these private investors. And that's why, and those were, I think, indisputably securities offerings. They were not sold to these investors who are going to use it on RippleNet. You know, these there were direct statements from Ripple Labs and, and, and pitch decks about why these investors should buy it and why it would go up in price based on Ripple's development efforts. So I think at least in those cases, like there's no reasonable argument that those weren't securities offerings. And it was a lot of Ripple that was sold. And so I don't, I don't know why $2 billion would be inappropriate here. Yeah, so the, the language actually used by Judge Torres is the the programmatic sales. Those are the ones that she found not to be an investment contract. And most notably, she cites this uh, blind bid ask sort of uh, uh, on, on an exchange, bid ask transaction on an exchange where you don't know whether you're buying from the company or you're buying from Joe or Zach who's selling their XRP on, on exchanges, that the programmatic sales somehow um, is 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 sufficient uh, to uh, negate the, the the securities analysis. But to Zach's point, right, the institutional sales, which is the language used by the court, those were unquestionably investment contracts, and that's what we're talking about here uh, with respect to you know the the, the penalty. So we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. But you know, I think um, and, and it's been a while since I looked at the, looked at it, but. I think the institutional sales themselves were in the billions of dollars. So to say that there should be a $2 billion penalty, um, I don't know if necessarily that's a, a disproportionate uh, remedy. So uh, coming, so keeping on that point of institutional sales, now, okay, fine, they will fine XRP for conducting these sales. What about the private investors? Will they also have any uh, legal, uh, they'll be legally bound in some way as well? When you say private investors, yeah. you, you you mean, I think, people buying it on the secondary market? Not really. Coinbase or no, Coinbase. people who are buying from uh, XRP, like the sales that XRP might have conducted initially, uh, from what you said, from what I at least understood is that there are two types of buying that one can do is one from exchanges where you have blind uh, ask and bid. And the other one is the institutional where XRP is raising money for something and offering XRP, sorry, Ripple is raising money for something and offering XRP as a way to redeem their profits in future, which kind of, I just, as a common person, I just called it a security similar to a bond, uh, sorry, similar to a stock. So yeah, there we are. 
uh, we don't need a judge need a judge for that but will the investors who basically participated in that sort of an investment be also legally you know wrong in any way if they can show damages so there are what are called private rights of action that allow you if you participated in a unregistered securities offering to bring a lawsuit against the company that sold those unregistered securities. And a big example of this that we're seeing right now is a large class action lawsuit against uh, Solana Labs, right? With people who bought Solana at some point. The problem is you need to show how you were damaged. Uh, and I don't actually know how this is gonna work in the Solana Labs case. If you bought Sol for two cents a Sol token and now it's trading above $200, uh, it's hard to see what your damages are. So technically, yeah. yes, but practically, it's hard to imagine. Yeah, exactly. Same thing with XRP, right? Most of those institutional buyers got really sweetheart deals relative to what retail did buying on Coinbase and other exchanges, right? So, so it's going to be very challenging for them to prove damages. So it's almost like, okay, you it was an unregistered uh, security, it was an investment contract, so what? How were you harmed by buying soul at two cents? <laughs> and to Zach's point, it's what is it trading at like, you know, a hundred and something dollars? Explain how your damages are, occurred. I think my question was taken in the wrong way. So I am not saying the private investors suing XRP. I'm saying SEC going after them. Oh, your liability for them. No, for, for purchasing it? No, no, makes, not for purchasing. Makes it. sense. Makes sense. So it is the companies. At, at least, at least not yet. We've not seen any of those lawsuits. I think. You know, look, especially around the 2021 bull run, I think things are happening a little bit different, differently now. But I, I bet you that you know, we're still seeing lawsuits from previous cycles. A lot of the cases we're seeing right now are, are still from like the 2017, 2018 ICO era. Um, if the SEC ends up beeping, beefing up its enforcement team, I would not be surprised if in the next five years we see some lawsuits against VCs from some of the stuff that went on in the 20 to 21 time frame where VCs were very involved in creating liquidity for coins, might have been involved in some wash trading in the public market that, you know, pumped their private sale bags. Like, I wouldn't say as like a full stop, VCs are never going to be found responsible for this, but just investing in an unresearched securities offering is not illegal. Makes sense. Yeah, but that's a different that's a different thing, right, Zach? Like the, them being involved in the actual market structure and yeah, and it's about it's about actual involvement. Just investing. I think that that in that we are basically going towards more market manipulation perspective. That they basically created that liquidity, or they basically manipulated the price in some way or the other. Uh, but yeah, not from an investment perspective, like. Let's say tomorrow Solana comes to me, which they are never going to come. I'm not that important yet for them. But they come to me and say, oh, we want to offer you Solana at, let's say, $100. Okay. If you put in two, two or three or uh, let's say $2 billion. Okay. So, and I say, well, that's a good deal for me as a person because I'm getting Solana cheaper. Am I at any point responsible for my actions in that case or am I yeah. as a businessman? Yeah. I'm not. And you're just, all you're doing is just buying, right? Yeah. That's all you're yeah. doing. You're not engaged anywhere else otherwise in the project, yeah. promoting it, uh, to telling your followers to support yeah. it. anything beyond that. You're, you're not supporting the price in any way, no. just buying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? That, that's my point. Yeah. Like that investor does not care yeah, about yeah. So, so I, I, I can say personally, and I don't know if I speak for Zach on this, but I, think, I would say with a high degree of confidence, you do not personally have liability under the hypothetical you would make you just set forth makes sense because i was thinking yeah and look i'll be i'll be honest with you as as a like market participant right there are, there are multiple projects that i might be interested in buying that i would not ever be interested in being a part of because the like potential liability for an investor and a like operator are are very very different makes sense like the reason i asked this question is because we get to meet a lot of you know people when we are in this kind of sector because it's still a very booming sector very very it's evolving every day and then you kind of see what all pe people are doing and that's why i asked this question because we might have some vcs listening to this space as well trying to understand from a law perspective well how you know whether they whether they are in the right or in the wrong so it's it's good to know it yeah from what i say to vcs that i talk to about this is the securities law question is mostly a market risk and not a legal risk for VCs, right? If you have a project where the SEC goes after them, they might claw back profits. And you might even have to, if you were involved in some of the early sales to pay on the situation, you might even need to disgorge some of your profits, right? You might need to give 
money back if you made a lot of money early on, if you were found to be part of sort of a scheme to sell these things. Uh, but it's not you're not generally going to be held responsible for what the project did wrong. Uh, your risk is that your investment goes to zero. Makes sense. Thank you so much. I mean, I learned a bit. Uh, Tone, any question from the Ripple perspective from your side? No, no, I'd love to jump into economics now. Yes, 100 percent. That's the next that's the next uh, thing that we have. So, well, uh, Joe, before we go into S&P and everything else, uh, starting off with the uh, Bitcoin, how are you liking the price action? You were not here when we started off the conversation. So uh, I'll take your views on that first. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fantastic, right? Uh, I'm happy that we're up a little bit today. And uh, I mean, this is one of those things where uh, I, I think it's you, you don't want to be too, too silly and too cute about it. Um, just, you know, I'm riding the trend. I, I, I have stopped trying to, uh, I, I really have never for this, this whole period, uh, tried to call tops or bottoms. And from my standpoint, I think like this is just something to ride. Um, and what, what, what is interesting to me just from like a market structure standpoint is that I was looking at some data over the last like three months about how uh, non-correlated Bitcoin's price action has become with the S&P and the NASDAQ and that it's reaching one of the highest levels of dis, uh, discorrelation in its history um, that was provided to me by uh, some folks. And I reviewed it carefully. And I, I mean, that's really encouraging, right? Like at this point in the cycle early on where you have such a, uh, I'm not going to say decoupling, but a lack of correlation with the uh, traditional risk markets. I, I just view that as extremely encouraging. It just, to me, just, you know, again, this is not one thing where it's like a, uh, a, a more of a technical or, or fundamental thing, but it, just as an just as an observer of Bitcoin, I don't recall a period uh, since I've been following it since 2015 where Bitcoin has had like this sort of like relentless bid underneath it. It seems like it seems like it's unable to sell off, and I, I'm probably going to curse us here with this. So um, forgive me in advance, but I mean, I I just I would have accept expected. I mean, even Tone, I remember in some of our spaces expecting a sell off like at various different points, and just. It hasn't come, and obviously it can come, but you got to be encouraged looking at this. I mean, this this it just seems like a very strong, robust market where there are very few sellers. But one thing I'm, see, uh, Joe, if you remember, we discussed this uh, I think a couple of months back. Um, then we were having a chat, and you and I were having this conversation about uh, the markets not being in, you know, correlation right now, and maybe BTC will catch up. And it happened. That's very good for us. But I still feel that we are st still not in correlation. I still feel that there is an upper range of at least 20 percent, which Stone said at the start of the space that he still feels that 78,000 could be reached before halving. And for me, it's a 16 percent mark, which will take us to around 81,000, 82,000 area, which I feel will be reached before we see the real correction happen. That is pre post halving correction. Uh, so Tone, do you are you thinking like the same way? Like, cause my thinking in this in this aspect is that the market will catch up to S and P. So S and P five hundred has gone up uh, around. I think if I'm not mistaken, around ten percent from its all time high until this point. That is fifty three hundred dollars at this point of time. And Bitcoin has not gone up that much. And I mean, I'm and I'm also doubling the number uh, for the percentage move of S and P compared to Bitcoin. So whatever S&P goes up, I double that. And that's how I'm seeing that correlation happen, like one is to two correlation. So do you, are you looking at it from a similar perspective or your uh, thesis is something different tone? No, I'm definitely not looking at it from that perspective. Uh, the percentage that the S&P is above its all time high uh, to me is kind of irrelevant. Uh, when Bitcoin breaks out, Above 73, I think uh, it can go up very, very quickly, like the, just the concept of FOMO. And what usually happens is, you know, it goes up and then it crashes down for a day. We And Joe, we did have uh, a couple of corrections in the last, what, three, four weeks. Uh, those corrections have just been very short on time. They they were big. But, but, but Tony, to, don't you think that's significant? The fact that you, you get the, I mean, to me, it's a leverage flush, right? Like, isn't that a leverage flush that gets bought up really quickly? It's almost an inorganic sure. correction. Yeah. Sure. Well, it, yeah, no, sure. It just happens really quick. I mean, that that could be good for some people's positions. Uh, that are Like, for example, the longer term holders, this is great. They, they don't have enough time to really fear and panic and sell. 
Uh, but for the short term leverage guys, that's a disaster, right? They also don't have time to think and get out of those positions before they, you know, wipe out their accounts. So it was just a different type of correction. Like we were corrected like 15% in like a day the other day, uh, like a month ago or something. And that's, the, the, that's bad. Uh, I think something happened, something crashed. Uh, I forgot what it was. Uh, I already forgot Coinbase. the reason for it. Coinbase, what happened? Coinbase, crashed. Coinbase crashed. No, not, not Coinbase crashed. Sorry, the Coinbase lawsuit came out. We were like, yeah, the lawsuit. The, the lawsuit. lawsuit. We, we were we were telegramming back. And yeah, the lawsuit. You thought triggered a little bit of a sell, but it was like a four thousand dollar sell off. I mean, right, was, right, right, but, 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 but right. That's what I mean. Like they're not like big corrections, but it happened at the worst time. Like Bitcoin was literally breaking out up into all time highs. Like so, yes, it only fell four percent. But if that news didn't come out, I think we would have gone to seventy eight like that that week. I mean, it was just ready for that uh, uh basically a short squeeze if there's anybody still short but um i think it's ready for one of those one more time uh and my price target before the halving is between 78 and 92,000 and the middle of that zone is 84,000 so anything uh you know if it gets to 90 that's great but if it does get to 90 i will definitely be looking for a significant pullback but more realistically, uh, uh, more realistically, uh, seventy-eight to uh, uh, to eighty-four. Yeah, that, that sounds about a sensible uh, range for like if we are looking for a correction. I mean, it might just start pumping. And as uh, I can't pronounce your name, uh, Vale Gal Team says this host is going to get cooked. Or for, this host is will continue to get smoked trying to time Bitcoin. Yeah, man, trust me, it's so tough. I don't know where to book for profits. Teach me. I really want to learn that. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Doctor One of One uh, has a question. Yeah. Go on. So all time high, the significance of that, more or less. If we look at Bitcoin all time high. So what? Big deal, right? Oh, the S and P five hundred at an all time high. So what? Big deal. It's not just individual all time highs that matters. It's multiple all time highs happening at the same time. You're you're gonna make money with an all time high. I mean, <laughs> that's that's the whole point. But what happens when everything all times highs? And everybody makes money. Then, then, then well, everybody does. Everybody doesn't everybody make money doesn't make if money. they're short, right? Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah, everybody doesn't make money if they've bought into a bearish narrative and they're positioned for a, a crash or economic collapse or the the great financial crisis 2.0. And there is a ton of capital. I know just anecdotally, I talk to people about looking for a pullback, looking for a correction, waiting to buy the dip, right? And the market doesn't give you, in my experience, I don't think the market gives you that when you've got so many people out there just frustrated, shaking their fist at the air saying, this market doesn't make sense. Right. There's more money sitting in bonds than in stocks. And stocks continue to make all-time highs and bonds have been going down for years. And bonds got lucky with, uh, with the interest rates crashing uh, due to the COVID lockdowns. Otherwise, the bond market would have been on the decline for like five straight, five, six straight years now. Uh, and uh, only the, you know, the, the bond market rise uh, because rates crashed with the lockdowns. That, that, that kind of benefited the, the bond market. And uh, right, the stock market, the gold market, Bitcoin market, uh, they're all rising against the dollar. I mean, real estate, I'm, I'm assuming, is close to an all-time high uh probably not there because the interest rate went up a bit and these are assets that uh go against the devaluing us dollar now the us dollar is still very very strong against other fiat currencies but when it comes to more tangible tangible assets uh they're crushing the us dollar and they will continue to do so so joe i'm not sure um, where or what post convinced you that Bitcoin is uncorrelated with the stock market? I mean, uh, to me, Bitcoin is still very correlated with the stock market. Uh, and uh, like the further, uh, the longer your range. No, 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 no. You, you, you misheard me. I did not say uncorrelated with the stock market. I said it has the lowest ratio of correlation at any point in Bitcoin's history. 
that, that it's very different. On what, still all on, what, the risk on what time frame? Like, like what correlation? What thirty day correlation? On, on monthly eighty on monthly I time frames. Monthly time frames. So thirty day correlation. Correct. Okay. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll I'll telegram you what I read, but um, but but the, the the long and the short of it is that like even on days where the S and P has struggled and sold off, Bitcoin has has hung in better than it is is uh, historically hung in, right? Like like even on those days where you there, there was a day a few weeks back where you had a you know a modest like one percent uh, drawdown in the queues, um, and, and Bitcoin held up like it, normally it would it, historically rather it would it would sell off you know. Four or five percent. Bitcoin's like barely down one percent, one and a half percent. The correlation ratio is what I'm talking. Gotcha. About. Wait, oh, it, it, um, it's not being low tone. I mean, I, I'll rephrase the question, Joe. It's not being low, as in like low, low correlation. It's that the correlation, like you depend the way you see correlation, can be different things, right? It's one one is day to day correlation, which is like today S and P is down. What is Bitcoin doing? Bitcoin is also going down. I think it's the power of correlation that Joe is referring to, the extent at which it's yes. happening. Exactly the degree of correlation. Yep. That's that's correct, and, and and that 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 is a sign of a maturing market, right? Like. If a, if a market is weaker, if it has less institutional capital, if it's more jittery, right, it, if it's higher beta, it tends to sell off more violently than markets that are mature, right? Like, and this is true of a lot of assets. As assets get bigger, um, they get, you know, less, less, generally, they get less susceptible to broader forces in the market. This is why, like, the altcoins, like, when Bitcoin goes down, if you ever notice, like, the altcoins absolutely get thrashed when Bitcoin goes down. When Bitcoin's, when Bitcoin's falling hard, the altcoins are down. You know, Bitcoin can be down 4 or 5%. The altcoins are down 20 This is why, because the altcoins just don't have, a, have as much of, a, of an anchor. They don't have as much of a solid base of support, and they free fall much faster than Bitcoin would. John? So here's the thing with correlation, though, is even though we're trying to find a correlation between Bitcoin all time high and everything else. What's not correlated, though, is you say, oh, Bitcoin reached an all time high, but then it went down. The S&P was correlated to that because the S&P reached an all time high, but then it went down and they're both down in the red right now. So they're correlated. You could, you know assume that correlation but if you look at the nvidia stock it has nothing to do with with whether or not um bitcoin and the s p are correlated or not so even the nvidia even if nvidia stock was correlated to bitcoin and s p 500 there's going to be another stock that nobody's even paying attention to so, you know, I mean, there's thousands of stocks, there's thousands of cryptocurrencies. I mean, is there any uh, other? Well, I, 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 didn't, I, didn't really, I didn't really see a question there. It's more of a statement. And so uh, NVIDIA, like, in, yeah, how, do you, how do you explain NVIDIA's growth and reaching an all time well, high? Every single asset in the world uh, has its own path, its own path of speculation. Uh, in general, uh, NVIDIA drives the S&P 500. They're going to be correlated. Uh, and they're very correlated. The leader of an index is very correlated to the index. And uh, some penny stock or some shit coin has, is completely uncorrelated to the index. So this is just like you, you, just, you, you put out statements that are quasi-accurate, but quasi-aren't really saying anything. So I, I don't really know yeah, how to comment. Let's just let's just move on for a second. But uh, but I want I want to point out one thing. Okay, constantly the argument from the bears that you've heard. Can you hear me? Uh, Joe, well, well, okay. yeah, you're uh, going. Uh, uh, going argument Joe. from the bear is I'm not going to get into Nvidia because Nvidia's stock price isn't correlated to the market, meaning. The only reason no, no, no one no one gets into a stock for correlation purposes. Uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, people, just, sorry, in, people invest in a single asset for the purposes of speculation and them thinking they know more about that asset than the general public. Uh, now, correlation is just something that we keep an eye on. 
but no one invests into anything based on a correlation chart. It's just an interesting thing to discuss every now and then. And it's not so that important. My, my question, though, I, I want to share why one, did one. the NVIDIA stock... Oh, let Joe, let Joe go, let Joe go. Le, 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 yeah, let's I, go. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I, had, I had a quick call, but I, uh, there's been this argument that's been from the bears um, for months now, really, where it says that the rally and risk on is concentrated, that it's too too concentrated in the highest, biggest mega cap tech games. That's obvious, right? Like that, that it's clear. Those are the historically those are where the majority of the gains of any index come from. Their biggest mega caps that dominate the index. That's how an index works, especially a market cap one. But I'll, but I'll borrow um, one point that uh, and I'll share with you that I. I heard a recent podcast with Jason Shapiro that he pointed out that I think is spot on is that, look, the, the telltale sign you're in a full blown bull market in risk assets is looking overseas at the Nikkei. OK, the Nikkei, which has no mega cap tech, right, which has no huge NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple is breaking out above all time highs set back in the early 90s okay that is a message that is being sent and you can choose to ignore it or not you can choose to throw up fundamental analysis or why you know the market should be selling off and it should be recessionary because of rates and all this stuff but at the end of the day like when you look at that that single data point from a index that has struggled for decades now for a variety of reasons macroeconomic in japan and it's breaking out that is telling you there is there is a large force in play that says bid risk assets across the board and that is confirmed with bitcoin it's confirmed with many other elements of the risk uh, uh risk asset ecosystem and i think it is something that we should all be talking about in, in the financial summit rooms because that that it should not be ignored and in to me this skepticism that we get with every turn that a top is near um it just tells me that like we're far from a top Hundred percent. I don't be surprised. I'm surprised yeah. Mitsubishi is not considered a mega cap. In, uh, but but you're right. I haven't looked at the Japanese top ten companies. No, Tun. I think the point, uh, uh, Joe. I totally agree with your point. Like all across the board, all the markets are outperforming, and I think this is one of those bull markets. And I think it's this. It's to do with most bull markets. When you do not expect the markets to perform really well, that's when they just surprise you and they just start performing. And people just kept keep waiting for that dip. And that dip is what kind of uh, stops them from making money or being part of the market at that point of time. That's a bull run when the market does not wait for you. Right? Uh, DR, uh, is, is there uh, your question, if you have one? Yes, I, I have a question, but I also have the answer to the question. So the question is, why is NVIDIA stock at an all-time high? The well, the NVIDIA stock I mean, is... I, if you, I'm sorry, like if you have to ask that question, uh, no, I, the po the point I, that I think there's a problem no, no, with no, the no, question. No. Because the, the, the answer the is that... either... I mean, no, I, I again, answer. I'm trying to figure out your point so because I'm, know, I'm getting a little I, frustrated I with your comments and questions. Okay, I know the answer. The answer is because NVIDIA created new technology, new hardware, um, groundbreaking computer chips that nobody else has ever been able to create. So they... No, that's not the answer. Due to... That is not the answer. It, yes, has, it, is. it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, what NVIDIA has invented. Why is MicroStrategy going to be uh, you know, the highest company, they didn't invent anything. The answer is, is because speculators believe that NVIDIA is still a good investment. And that's why the stock is going up, regardless of what NVIDIA actually did or didn't. Well, so the answer at, to you your question, just to be clear, you, NVIDIA doubled its revenue from last year, right? It doubled its revenue. Like the notion that like, oh, it's just a mis mystery why NVIDIA uh, is, is doing well. is just beyond me. So it's. Yeah. If you, so if let you me let NVIDIA, me summarize this thing. Wait, 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 wait a second. Let me summarize this for you. The reason a stock price goes up or down, there's only one reason. Somebody wants to buy and somebody wants to sell. The buyers are more, the sellers are less. A stock price is the stock, stock price is correlation with the market is only that much. A company can outperform everyone, but if people do not want to buy their stocks, the price will not go up because the market only reacts to buyers and sellers. 
right? Otherwise, the price will stay the same. If everyone feels this company is hundred dollars, well, it is hundred dollars. That's what the real price of the company is. But, but, so but, that but, but, look, I, I'm, I'm sorry. This, this space is way more advanced to explain why a company is at an all time high. Like, I want to move on to like like better topics. Yeah. Here. Yeah, let, let, let's 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 move on. Uh, Dear, thank no, you no, for your on, question. I, I, I need to finish what I'm saying because I was cut off and I was rudely interrupted. If you look at Nvidia's competition, it's AMD, and AMD stock is it has not seen has not reached an all time high. So you can't say that oh the market as a whole has gone up. Therefore, that's why Nvidia has. 10x its competitors it's beat its competitors it's created new technology that is why the nvidia stock went up well but because this is yeah. obvious the, the, i mean like uh, i mean there are 12 year olds on robin hood that understand this like i don't understand why we're talking about this topic Obviously, yeah, Nvidia is stock bad. is doing well so because the company is, that, is doing well, and investors will invest in Nvidia more than so they will I'm invest in AMD. When it, when it like, again, I don't understand the point. Okay, you don't yeah. understand, but what I'm saying is, a company well, that, I think the space is going a little bit. Uh, uh, the, I think the space is going a little bit off scale off uh, the chart. So, DR, no, I'm going to skip this chart. question. This, this is not off chart. My w one second, please. Uh, it's going a little bit off direction. Um, well, I have a set of topics that need to be covered in the coming few uh, minutes as well. So uh, I'll take this question. Uh, I'll reply to you whatever answer you require. We'll ask the team to reply to you in that answer in a personal message. But obviously, there are 120 people or 220 people listening to us right now, and they need to carry on. So yeah, uh, let's stop it there. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for your question. Uh, if you want to say, uh, if you want to ask one last question, go ahead. Otherwise, I don't want to entertain this topic anymore. I guess not. Uh, cool. Okay. So, carrying on, Tone. Uh, so, Tone, uh, well, you, well, you, have to, you, have to, you you had to unmute, right? Everyone was muted, so yeah, he couldn't yeah, answer yeah. even if he wanted yeah, to. I'm but sorry, he, I had to do that. There was a lot of uh, back and forth he, going he on. So. Yeah, he, look, he dropped off, but I'm sorry, like everything yep. that that person said, like it was like random points that are either too obvious or make no sense. So I, I didn't know what I should be answering there. Like, uh, uh, obviously, when a company is when a company stock is trading at an all time high and it's leading an index, uh, people want to invest and speculate in that company. Why do they want to do that? They want to do that because the company is doing very, very well. They're making a lot of profit. How do you make a lot of profit? You make innovative technology. I mean, this is just the simplest logic ever. Sometimes the market gets it wrong, and you know, a company like Enron or Bear Stearns is sitting at the top of the market, and then, oops, the next day, you or Enron, you know, like I, I, mean, I might have said Enron, um, and the next thing you know is that there was a lot of fraud going on, or the company wasn't doing as well as everybody thought. That happens sometimes. But that's literally one in thousands of chances that the market gets it wrong like that. 99% of the time, the market is correct. And the companies that are doing well are doing well for the for a reason. And a lot like there's no uh you don't need to do a deep dive on how much better uh NVIDIA is over AMD. The market and the stock price and how it's gone up in the last year answers that question the only people that need to do a deep dive into the reports and the earnings reports and um, any other you know deep dives like that are people that are looking to a hold that stock for years and years and years and pass it on to their children or uh hedge funds or other investment firms that are entering with such large positions, they can't just exit the following week. Uh, and they have the resources to do that kind of analysis. Uh, but for the average person to analyze why AMD is doing better than its competitors, I mean, there, there's really no reason to analyze it. I just don't, I just see that as a total waste of time. It, it was, Tone, and that's down to your host, guys. So sorry uh, for the questions that came your way. It uh, and uh, guys, uh, he posted a link in the nest. Uh, I've removed it. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting that, uh, uh, people. Uh, Cam highlighted it to us. Uh, thank you so much. 
uh, I, I saw his profile. He looked, looked valid and we thought he might have a question. That's the bad things about having an open space where you let people come up and ask questions because they try to hijack it. But yeah, we are still an open space, guys. If you have a good question, uh, either post it in the tweets. Uh, we will take it from there. And if you have been a previous speaker, if you want to come up and talk about something, uh, feel free. We, we know our previous speakers and we will invite them for sure. So Tone, moving on, uh, for sure, moving on now. Uh, to help with Nvidia for a bit. Oh man, so, it, sucks, it, sucks that, it sucks that sucks that Joe left. I really wanted to ask him what he thought of Powell's speech uh, last week. Too bad. Yeah, I mean, don't worry. He'll be here on Wednesday for sure, and uh, we we'll have. Yeah, few we more gotta be. Uh, we, we we gotta be super selective on who we bring up here to like speak. Uh, pe people need to ask like if they can't ask good questions in reply to the space in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, I'm really starting to, uh, like like 80% of the people that we bring up here are not productive, <laughs> to say the yeah, least. Yeah, I agree. But uh, it, it, that's how we are different. I mean, people will start understanding. And now I'll try to keep a track of people who have come before so that we can have good questions coming through, uh, not what we just had. So moving on, Tone, uh, we have the unemployment numbers coming out next week. Uh, we well, Another indication for... Uh, Fed to decide whether they want to uh, keep the rates the same or to start cutting them. Uh, S&P 500 is closing a very, very strong month. I mean, this monthly candle looks amazing uh, from whatever perspective you see. Total of five straight months of up only. Uh, such So much of strength is going on in the market. Tund, are you starting to expect some sort of a correction in the market in terms of S&P 500? Because I am. Now, just to give you my point no. of view. I am expecting no, a correction now. I'm not. Absolutely not. Especially with Powell saying he may lower rates three times. Absolutely not. Uh, I don't see any reason why I would be fearful right now in the market. It would have to drop first, and then I would expect a bigger correction. I continue to be a big bull in the market. I've been a big bull in the market, uh, and I see no reason why it would stop. Clearly, there is still a lot of money. Uh, in the system. Try to go get a nice restaurant on a Friday night. It's almost impossible. Uh, I don't know how people are affording these $100, $200 steaks, but uh, I, I can't get a seat sometimes unless I make a reservation uh, a few days before. Like, it, uh, uh, I see a couple of you, like Winston is here. Just imagine like a new, uh, a new sauna place opened up in Manhattan. And uh, we went there, checked it out. That's the one that has like Bitcoin uh, mining that powers some of the heat there. I'm still skeptical on that claim, but whatever. It's a brand new place, just opened. It's nice. It's not cheap. Uh, and you can't even go there anymore without a reservation. Uh, and the place is huge. You can fit like a, over 100 or 200 people and you can't even walk in. That's how much demand there is for this thing. So like the luxury side of things is has more demand than ever. And if the luxury side of things has more demand than ever, nice restaurants, nice experiences, uh, like high-end hotels, uh, airlines. So here's another example. Uh, last time I flew to Dubai, uh, last time I flew to Dubai was in October. Okay. Now the pandemic's already been over. So I flew to Dubai in October, same airline, same flight, basically, but in October. I What I normally do is, and I kind of discovered it on that flight, I booked a an economy class flight to Dubai one way, I don't know, about 800 bucks, 700 bucks one way, because uh, I always fly one way because I never know where, where, where I'm going to next. And uh, 700 bucks economy. Now, the business class upgrade at the time that I was buying the ticket was like maybe $3,000. But as time gets closer to my flight and they have a lot of empty seats in business, the price of that upgrade drops. I was able to get a business class upgrade for $500, okay? Uh, that's what they do. They drop the price with like a week to go because they have a lot of seats. So they might as well take 500 to a thousand bucks for the same seat they were trying to sell for like 3000. So, and the same thing happened on my flight home, by the way, uh, uh, same thing happened on my flight home, uh, like two weeks later, early November or something, something like that, early to mid November. Uh, that was during a financial summit, by the way, you were there. Uh, 
Now, yes. I did the same. I did the same exact thing right now. I'm flying to Dubai in April. So this is now six months later. I booked my economy flight for six or seven hundred bucks. And initially, there were like half the business class was open, and those uh, prices were like three grand. I'm like, okay, I'll wait. Uh, I'll probably get it for under a thousand. Then, like two weeks ago, the price was actually up to five thousand, but there were still a bunch of seats. I'm like, all right, not good. I don't really want to pay five thousand for a business class upgrade, but I also don't want to sit in economy for fourteen hours straight either. Uh, now, my flight is in two weeks. I just checked this morning, and there's only three seats left in business, and the price is now twelve thousand dollars. So literally, people have money. I'm gonna get stuck in economy because I got greedy, didn't want to pay the three grand. Now it's twelve grand for that same seat, and those three seats are gonna get sold at twelve grand. It is six months later. I don't know if more people are flying to Dubai in April than last October. Uh, I don't see a big difference here. Not much has changed, but clearly people have money. People have money that can buy uh, business class flights to fill out that plane. And these are the people that buy stocks. It's not the little guy. It's not the guy that's trying to, that's complaining his Chinese food is too expensive. That's not the guy that's buying stocks. It's the guy that can afford that business class flight. It's the guy that can afford a hundred dollar stake. Uh, and this luxury market is booming. It's absolutely booming. So yes, I expect stocks to go significantly higher. Well, talking of luxury, uh, guys, if you haven't visited our, visit our, our website, do visit the financial summit.com for oh, sorry, financial summit.com. Uh, oh, basically, visit. sorry, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'm getting better at this. So guys, uh, Financial Summit is going to be held from March 16 to March uh, 21st, 2025 in Maldives. Uh, Tone has already shared the lovely villas that are available uh, for the, the next Financial Summit. And I'm going to be bribing him as much as I can to get the villa, which is right on top of the ocean. It's going to be a great event where you'll get to meet a lot of diff different people, traders, nutritionists, uh, physical experts even doctors uh hedge fund managers vcs a lot of different people will come through to the event at that point of time so if you haven't signed up please do visit the website they, we are still running a early bird offer in which you get the best uh, up, you get the first upgrade as part of uh, booking your uh booking your uh, slot so yeah uh, please do feel free to go there so tone moving on from this uh, uh and going a bit towards Wow, I forgot. Sorry. Oh, yeah. By the way, I was about to say last December, I did the same thing tone. I was traveling from Cape Town back to UK and uh, I got an upgrade for $300, 300 pounds. So, yeah, that was fun. Whoa, did you say Cape, Cape Town, South Africa? Yeah, yeah, I was in Cape Town. Wow. Yeah, I, I like Cape Town. Yeah, that's a long flight. That's a series. That's, that, that, that's like a 12 hour flight for you. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. It was lovely, though. It was lovely time to be there in December. Lovely right. weather. And, and, and I guarantee you, you do that today, you're not getting that upgrade. Okay. Yeah. And I, I uh, always go and ask on the. Yeah. I basically do it on the day. I go and ask them how much is it for an upgrade if there is one, and they tell me the price, and then I'm like, uh, does it make sense or not? <laughs> so yeah, it depends on what you get, I guess. Most oh, likely totally not anymore. Sense. Yeah. So moving on to and so obviously S and P is gonna go up. Nasdaq is gonna go up. What are you expecting from unemployment rates? Uh, how do you see them coming out? I think they're going to be strong. I think the unemployment rate's going to come in uh, fairly strong. Uh, but again, a strong uh, unemployment, well, uh, low unemployment is good for the government and their re-election campaign. But uh, a strong unemployment, a strong employment is, uh, will prevent Powell from lowering the rate. So the government wants it both ways. I mean, the government want, want people to have jobs. They don't want massive unemployment unless it's a really evil government that wants to be more tyrannical. Uh, but in general, uh, the go government wants their people to be employed and they want lower interest rates. But the reason they want lower interest rates is because they're printing money like no tomorrow. Uh, they're not going to have it both ways. Uh, and uh, I don't think they're going to try to lower unemployment. I mean, they're bringing in a lot of illegals into the U.S. that could potentially lower unemployment, but it's not doing it. 
it, it's just not. And I think unemployment is going to, I think employment is going to stay strong and Powell will have a tough time lowering the rate. Yeah. Uh, okay. Makes sense. I am of the same boat. Uh, now I basically was thinking a bit different if you remember a couple of months back, but I think I'm learning from you. That's good. That's good for me. Uh, Tune, there's a question for you from, for you from lip tech. Uh, I think you know him because he calls you a buddy. So for sure, you know him. Uh, question is, what's your verdict about the way the Bitcoin cycle is going to run this this time? I think that's what he wants to say. Uh, I I will add a little bit to this question. <clears throat> Dude, I've read a lot on Twitter about left translated cycle, this cycle, that cycle. Is there anything called a left, left translated cycle? Like, is it even possible? Like, is it normal? Uh, I didn't understand. I said left correlated. I don't know what that means. No, le left left translated. Uh, so I think what people want to say with that is that, like normally you see a run up to the the all time highs are not broken. Like the correlations that people try to find in the market is that oh the, you know before having the all time highs are not broken and this time we have done that so it's a left translate. Like events are happening way before um, they normally do. I I don't know. I, I don't really see it that way. Uh, I I thought that the last bull market would have two peaks similar to the 2013 market. And uh, this market, I think it's, it's going to be more like the 2017 bull market. I think it's just going to be like one peak uh, with a few corrections in between. Uh, so that's kind of how I see it. Uh, the fact that we are a new all-time high before the halving to me is generally irrelevant. Uh, yes, it's never happened before, but our sample size was three. And uh, we're not like above the all time high by that much. Uh, I, I mean, it's uh, to me, it doesn't matter. I mean, maybe we'll peak earlier. Maybe we'll peak. Uh, maybe we'll go up slower and peak later. Uh, to me, these are just kind of minor things in general. So uh, I'm just looking for. At least a hundred and four, uh, somewhere between one hundred and twenty-five and one hundred and fifty. Uh, as long as we double from here one more time, I believe we had a decent bull market. I'm not going to say it was a great bull market, but for me, the minimum targets of this bull market before it ends, whether the bull market ends in six months or in eighteen months, uh, my minimum target for the bull market is a doubling from here. And if we can triple or quadruple from here, even better. Uh, and there's always two things to our market. There's price and there's time. Now, my uh, I already specified my time of the bull market. My time for this bull market is between six months from now and, uh, and 18 months from now. And my price targets for this bull market is between one doubling and like five doublings, right? So it's between, uh, say, 150,000 all the way up to a third of a mil. Uh, those are my price targets and those are my time targets. So it's very unlikely we're going to go past our time target and still be rising. And the worst case scenario for a long time target uh, of 18 months and the lowest price target of 150K, uh, that can happen. Uh, the opposite could also be true. You know, we can have uh, the highest price target inside the lowest time target, right? We can go to a third of a million dollars within six months. I think that's unlikely, but that's equally as unlikely as going up for the next 18 months and only reaching 150. So the answer is somewhere in between. Uh, we will top somewhere in between. We will uh, likely top prior than 18 months from now. And uh, we will likely top somewhere between 150 and a third of a mil. Uh, so let's see how that goes. And as time passes, we can be clearer on these targets. Uh, uh, Tone, uh, I, I do agree with that point, but obviously it's a wide target of, and I, I'm not asking you for a target. Trust me. I mean, I, I know trading this much that everyone's target is different and everyone has a different approach to finding it. So for, for everyone listening to this space, this range that Tone is saying of the higher, the higher levels do not come back to my space and tell me that he said that because what he's trying to tell you guys right now is that there are two things for a market time and price 
and both of them have to be taken together and seen where we are at what point of time right so tone the last topic of the day it is a bit political but i think it's getting more and more re relevant now uh, Rush, uh putin had a few comments that he made in the last week in regards of nato and slowly steadily i think this whole war even though not physically uh, you know totally physically there's no no such attacks or anything as such and i hope there are never but slowly steadily at least why a press this war is coming towards the west what are your views on that and how do you see this whole thing progressing i i didn't want to bring that topic onto the financial summit space but you are my lone information about yeah. these things so i really wanted to ask yeah. you yeah so i'm actually going to stay away from answering the question directly because uh, my personal youtube channel now covers this topic more and more i want to talk about it from the economic perspective and from the economic perspective countries that are going to align with uh, the BRICS, and I'm going to say the importance of uh, the BRICS in order right now are uh, probably still China, even though I'm almost tempted to put Russia ahead. And I can explain my reasons for saying why Russia is the top dog in the BRICS, even over China. Uh, but it's definitely Russia, China, and India is a very close third. Not a distant third, but a close third. And I have my reasons for saying uh, Russia is uh, right now the leader in the BRICS. And the reason why Russia is the leader in the BRICS, not because their economy is better than China's, is because Russia stood up to the big bully in the world being the United States. And China has not proven anything in regards to their military. And perhaps China will need to you know, show some teeth it, with their military in order to be the top dog, because it's clear that China's economy is way better than Russia's. But Russia's economy is growing incredibly quickly. And countries that are aligning with Russia and China, if you align with Russia, you align with China and India. It's almost impossible to align with only Russia or only China. So when I say a country is aligning with Russia, it is like saying they're aligning with Russia, China, India, and Brazil. Okay? Uh, so keep that in mind. A country like Serbia, which just publicly announced that they have they will never join NATO, which means they secretly announced they will never join the European Union. Their economy is actually doing better than most European economies. And they are being sabotaged by uh, the West every day of their lives. OK, and they're doing OK. They're doing OK because they have a relationship with China and Russia. Now, Argentina is going in the opposite direction. Argentina has decided to snub Russia, China, Brazil and India and doesn't want to do business with them. So while Argentina may benefit from, you know, firing 75 percent of their government employees and significantly lowering their, you know, government waste. Uh, that kind of policy could potentially create a revolution in Argentina, especially when Argentina is not putting their country on a good economic path for those people to have more jobs. Because if you are aligning with Europe and America, your country is in for a total disaster. You can look at Ukraine as a more recent example uh, and Israel as well. I think Israel is in serious trouble especially economically i'm not sure how they're functioning because their half their population is now in the military and the other well not half but like what 20 percent of their productive capacity of creating good economic environment is in the military went into the military and the other 20 percent uh left the country altogether uh because of the conflict so how is israel going to now compete in the economic marketplace uh i'm not sure uh but well we're gonna we're gonna all find out probably the united states will be paying their bills just like they've been paying ukrainian bills so uh again uh if russia goes to full-blown war against nato that could be trouble for russia because once again only so many russian productive males can go into the military versus uh, contributing to the economics of the country so there is you know a fine line there. Russia has also lost a lot of 
uh, young males, and I'm mostly focused on males here uh, because of a war situation. I mean, it's uh, if you if someone wants to, wants to get offended by that, that's fine. I'm also going to focus on males in terms of uh, you know taking the risk, starting new companies, being an entrepreneur, hiring people. That is also predominantly dominated by, by males, especially in Eastern countries um, like Russia. So uh, Russia lost a lot of young productive males because they didn't want to be conscripted into the army. Are they going to come back to Russia? Uh, I'm not sure. I think a lot of them have, you know, um, found nice life in countries like Georgia and Kazakhstan, Republic of Georgia, Kazakhstan. Uh, many went to Argentina. Uh, there are a few other countries. Oh, a lot went to Thailand and especially Phuket. Uh, many went to Dubai. Uh, those with money that have the highest productive capacity. Uh, so a lot of them left. Uh, will they be coming back? Uh, I'm not sure, but Russia needs to do everything in their power to try and get them back. Because if they can get them back, then Russia could become an economic powerhouse. So from the perspective of uh, global economics, uh, Russia is taking the lead here and more countries will be open towards Russia because their ability to stand up to the bully uh, while at the same time uh, a little cautious, like, is the war going to get out of hand? Now, I believe, uh, don't hold me to this, but I believe after the terrorist attacks in Moscow, where over 100 people were killed, uh, Russia is, uh, Russia is going to make a case that Ukraine had a lot to do with that terrorist attack. And if they, I, I'm not sure if they announced it yet because I'm still confused. Uh, that's why I'm not sure. Russia might have declared war on Ukraine, which they have not done yet. If Russia has declared war on Ukraine, or if they are going to declare war on Ukraine, based on the fact that they have now declared war, they can now escalate uh, how much more damage they can do to Ukraine. People that thought that Russia was aggressive to Ukraine back when they were calling it a special military operation, is about to lose their fucking shit, okay? Because now that Russia has declared war or about to declare war, they now have in their doctrines green light to destroy Ukrainian infrastructure. And you're seeing it right now. The electric grid, the water supply, uh, they can even go after the satellite system above Ukraine. They don't care if it's Elon Musk's uh, satellites or whatever, okay? So will that escalate the entire conflict? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Russia has also stated that if uh, NATO joins, Russia will uh, you know, bomb NATO's infrastructure, even if it's not inside Ukraine. So what does that mean? Uh, like if French troops do come in into Ukraine, Russia is going to target them specifically inside Ukraine. Now, that's not going to necessarily start a conflict between Russia and NATO, uh, unless NATO wants it to be. However, if uh, the West sends F-16 fighter jets, and the reason why Russia is not happy with the sending of F-16 fighter jets is because F-16 fighter jets are nuclear capable. Uh, what Russia is going to do is, well, you won't be able to land those fighter jets inside Ukraine. Russia will have already bombed every single airstrip inside the border of Ukraine. So the only way an F-16 jet would be able to take off and land, or if it finds a way to take off from Ukraine, by the time that jet's coming back an hour later, that airstrip will be completely destroyed by a hypersonic missile from Russia or from one of its submarines, or it doesn't matter. It will be that airstrip will be completely destroyed because Russia will see on satellite where the F-16 took off from, and they will bomb that airstrip within minutes after that jet takes off. Uh, so that means that Ukraine would have to, uh, or somebody piloting these F-16s, would have to take off from a NATO member country. Could be Romania, could be Poland. Uh, it's not going to be Hungary. They won't let them. Uh, but it's got to be in like Moldova, maybe. 
it's got to be a country that hates Russia and also apparently hates their own people because Russia is also hinting between the lines that if an F-16 takes off into Ukraine from an airstrip of a NATO country, Russia will bomb that airstrip in Romania, in Poland. Uh, it can't be France because they just won't fly that far, right? So it will do that. And will that escalate? Will that trigger Article 5 uh, for NATO countries to enter uh, the conflict? I don't know. Uh, technically, it can. But I believe that NATO would be smart enough not to fight Russia because they will lose uh, or we all lose. So what would that do to the economic landscape? Well, if Russia uh, decides to target an airstrip in a NATO nation, uh, that could cause a lot of panic uh, in Russia and uh, economically as well, because people will now fear that the outright war between NATO and Russia has started. Uh, uh, so it's really, really smart not to send the F-16s. And it's also smart of France not to send their troops in, but the, the West might do it anyway. Uh, again, from an economic perspective, this is also bad for Europe. If Russia targets uh, and uh, bombs an airstrip in Poland or Romania or Bulgaria, uh, though Bulgaria has somewhat you know, stayed quiet on this one, uh, then uh, once again, everyone in Europe is going to be scared that Europe is about to enter a full-blown war. And what's going to happen to all the wealth and all the money in Europe? All those people are going to send their money out of Europe. Where is that money going to go? It's not going to go to Russia. It's not going to go to China. It's not going to go to India. It's going to go to one and only one place, the American stock market. And maybe the American bond market, but probably not. It's going to go into real estate. It's going to go into gold. It's going to go into Bitcoin. It's going to go everywhere other than stay in Europe. And it's not going to go to Africa. That's for damn sure. It's not going to go to the Middle East. Uh, so the United States markets are incredibly bullish based on what's happening in Europe. Uh, I see Mel has her hand up. Uh, uh, Vish, you want to say anything else before uh, Mel goes on what I said? And, other, and then we'll hand it off to Mel. No, no I just want. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I, I mean, Mel, you can go on. I just wanted to say the only one thing I wanted to say is when have politicians been smart? So yeah, I am packing my bags here in London, off to maybe somewhere in Indonesia. But I think China will attack that. Not, so yeah, I don't know where I'm gonna go. Not lately. Not lately. You guys are actually pretty safe in London. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you've had about you've had about eight prime ministers in the last six months, but. Uh, uh, and only one or two of them were incredibly dumb that wanted to get Ukraine into this mess. Uh, but considering you have your own mess of getting rid of your latest prime minister and replacing him with another one, I think uh, the UK is going to be a little too preoccupied to join this mess for now. Oh, thank God. Uh, but if Kia Starmer gets in, uh, which would be very unfortunate, um, he might put you on the wrong path. Yeah, hey, I mean, I don't so care what they guys... do with their country. Go on, Mel. While you guys finish this up, make uh, Viking go a speaker. He would like to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, Mel. I tried to make him. I'm not. I can't find him right now. But he has asked this question. So, Tone, his question is: He has a bet with Adam uh, whether BTC will hit 100k before before the halving block or at the time of the halving block being mined. So he just wants your opinion. That's it. Yeah, I I did not agree with Adam when he made that bet. I did not think Bitcoin would break 100K uh, by the halving. And I think you're good on your bet. But, you know, uh, Adam Back has got a lot of resources. Uh, if Bitcoin is close to 80K, uh, Adam can make some phone calls to some uh, good friends of his to push that price over the top. So uh, don't, don't hold it past him and we would all benefit, except unfortunately you. <laughs> cool. Uh, Mel, you wanted to add something on the Russia uh, topic? No, and I'm kidding, of course. I was just helping you out in the uh, watching the chat and uh, making sure. I didn't know if you saw his question or not. Yeah, no, no, no. I was looking at his chat. It's just that the, the experience we had today with one of our uh, 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 listeners to come up on the space, I just just a bit skeptical in inviting anyone else. So I didn't know whether Viking Go was one of our or uh, old uh, speakers or old listeners or yeah. not. So that's why I just didn't invite. So, you, yeah, sorry, Viking Go. 
I'll well, make sure that they're for... good. You know, I know the good ones too, so you're safe with me. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Mel. Um, yeah, I won't do our. Um, I'm going to the El Salvador having party. I'm going to be there on Wednesday. I'll be there for about three, four days. Uh, and after that, Bitblock Boom uh, conference in Dallas, Texas. If anyone is listening to this and you are currently located in Austin and you plan to come down to El Salvador from Austin, can you please DM me and reach out to me? My uh, poker chips are in Austin and I would love for someone to pick them up and bring them to El Salvador. Uh, I, I had someone that was going to do that, but the person has gone MIA for 10 days and we would love to play some poker in El Salvador. Uh, but I need to get my chips from Austin to do that. I guess I can bring my set from here in Panama, but those Austin chips will go then to Bitblock Boom in Dallas and they'll just stay in Texas. Uh, so that would be awesome if someone could. I think I can, uh, I think I can think that that happens thing. for you. All right. Yeah. That, that, that'd be great. Uh, we got to, we, we, uh, yeah, we, we got to do this like the next day or two. Like I'd like them for the because like the, the a person is holding them and then we have to reach out to that person as well. Uh, so, yeah, if you know anyone that is going to fly from Austin uh, to El Salvador next week, uh, let's connect. Guys, one thing if you don't know about Tone, I mean, we might have some new listeners who have not followed Tone for forever. I doubt that will be the case, but he has only three things in his life. OK. One is Bitcoin. Number two is traveling. But the third one is very, very crucial. That's poker. He cannot live without it if he's traveling. Trust me, he can't. He just loves his poker. Uh, Tone, where are you planning wait, to wait, participate wait, wait. in the whole tournament? I, I, I do have to add two more. Uh, I am in no particular order. Uh, the female gender uh, I, <laughs> and uh, also tequila. <laughs> OK, cool. Oh, tequila. Sorry. Sorry, Tone. My bad. Uh, female <laughs> gender, I, the female gender, I did not ask you a lot about it in our spaces or when we have met, uh, but tequila for sure. Yes. He was the guy who got me hooked to tequila. I mean, I was like, I don't like tequila. He's like, try this. I'm like, OK. And I was like, OK, now on tequilas. Uh, so, well, that was it, Tone. That is today's space and a lovely space apart from a few hiccups, but amazing to have a chat again and uh, looking forward to Wednesday. Awesome. Thanks again. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, Unconfiscatable will be back. I've already got a confirmation from one of the venues. It'll be very, very different. Uh, the website will be updated shortly. It will take place mid-September, probably September 16 to 18, possibly the week later. But all right, now I am trying to set up September 16 to 18, and tickets should be going on sale next week once I'm in El Salvador. Uh, the early price will be very cheap, and then, uh, and, but the total sellout capacity is also going to be smaller. So I, it's going back to a small event, maybe 250, 300 people, and we're going to keep it that way as a super fun hangout. Uh, if you haven't been, uh, you have no idea what you're missing. And uh, shout out to Surfer Jim that's been to all of them. Run, ride, fly. You've been to them. Winston, you've been to them. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining, guys. Hey, and uh, Mel's but, uh, actually close, Mel. run one. Thanks for having Say again? I said Mel has actually run one of them. Yes, so I was just about me. to say that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, that. Yes, Mel, thanks for uh, organizing the last one. Uh, this one will be smaller. Mel will be helping out as well. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, take the point and lead on this one because it's smaller. It's not going to have speakers inside of a hotel. It's going to be more, you know, fun hangouts in places that have a bar. So, Tone, where is it this time around? Uh, where are you planning to uh, keep it? it? It will literally be in the same area. Uh, I will probably stay not in the same hotel, but maybe at a hotel right down the street. Uh, it'll be, uh, it just will not be inside of a hotel, but it's literally in the same area. Uh, which uh, is downtown not... downtown Las Vegas, Fremont Street. Okay. Well, September, yeah. I'll have a chat with the, the treasurer of my house, uh, my family, and uh, try to see if I can make it as well this time around. Totally worth it. Lovely. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so much. Take care.